what a lot of people don't realise is their suppressed creativity will be causing them upset because I, I don't believe that some people are creative and some people are not because there is lots of different ways to be creative. I always think of that quote from Picasso where he said, I spent 20 years trying to paint like Raphael and then the rest of my life trying to paint like a child again. And she said it's called post-traumatic growth where this something comes out of this traumatic experience and it changes the perspective and allows you to move in a way you wouldn't have done so before. Hello, and I'm delighted to welcome you to another episode of my podcast, Art After Dark, where we explore the transformative impact of the arts on mind, body and soul. I'm your host, Louise Emily, an artist on a mission to shed light on the power of human creativity. Today's guest is Claire James. Claire James was brought up in the countryside of the South Downs and has always had a love for nature and the outdoors. Claire has also always had a passion for art and creativity. After studying psychology at university, she completed her PGCE in primary teaching and taught in London for six years. Claire married her husband, Harry, in 2018, and then they welcomed their son, Milo, in 2019. Then things changed. In November 2021, when Claire had just turned 31, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Not sure how she was going to cope with the upcoming chemo and mastectomy, Claire decided to start a creative journal where each day she would draw or paint her experience of living with cancer and then write a caption to go with it in order to process and share her experience. After being given the all clear and recovering, Claire decided to turn her drawings into a book and created A Year With C, Cancer, Creativity and Claire. She is now retraining as an art psychotherapist and is trying to share her passion for creativity. As you can see, darkness has fallen it's time to welcome Claire to the forest. Welcome. Hello. Hello. <laughs> really lovely to see you. Thank you um, for having me. Yeah, oh no, it's an absolute pleasure. So uh, are you all packed? Have you got your bag and, and snack? I do, yeah. Brilliant. Can you share with us what you've got inside it? So I've always liked bags with sort of little pockets and compartments for each thing. So it's got lots of little pockets for paintbrushes and sketchbooks and various little bits and the drink and, you know, the hold on the side. You know, I've always liked the bags that are a bit more kind of technical I guess so inside I've got my water bottle which is my trusty water bottle has a straw <laughs> a child but it <laughs> makes me drink more water and also my snack which I've got with me is chip sticks which are just my absolute favorite it was the only thing really I could eat in the first trimester of pregnancy yeah. so I was eating them eight o'clock in the morning which I was reading a How to Grow a Baby or whatever, the book. And it, it said, if you're eating chips six in the morning, you're okay. And I thought, well, that's fine. <laughs> and it was uh, funny enough, they were also the only, one of the only snacks I could eat when I was going through chemo. So, yeah, they are my trusty snack that I can eat. Oh, brilliant. Time of day. Oh, what flavour? And is it salt and vinegar or plain? Yeah, salt and vinegar. Oh, yeah. God, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm there. I haven't had a chip stick for ages, actually. Oh, I yeah. Need... So good. It's made me want to go for it. Yeah. They're and also I... one of the cheapest, actually. In the yeah. Supermarket. yeah yeah they're quite sort of generic crisps, yeah, yeah, yeah. Aren't they? yeah 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 a little bit sort of filthy crisp but <laughs> in, a... <laughs> in a good way yeah <laughs> my other one was I used to like discos as well oh yeah they're good yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. anything salt and vinegar to be honest definitely <laughs> well I think you are all ready to go into the forest so Great. we would love you to illuminate the path for us can you share your first creation so my first creation was actually my A-level piece. I did art at A-level. And after kind of studying art at school, my art teacher, though he was lovely, he is, his passion was fine art. So he wanted us to paint kind of up close pictures of people's faces that were incredibly beautiful and everyone would admire, which obviously is nice, but it's not necessarily what I enjoyed doing because it's more about what you're producing rather than the process and the making so then when I arrived at college he was a completely different person and he was far more about the abstract and about exploring and if you produced a blank canvas and could explain why it was blank canvas he would support it so he was an incredible teacher and he really helped me to find my style I guess in the sense of the way I paint now so that piece with the trees it was my first piece where I really looked at it and I felt like I'd produced something and enjoyed producing something that I was proud of and that I felt good about so it really unlocked my kind of freedom to be more abstract and more creative in that sense 
That's really interesting because it distinguishes between your skills in the first instance. Mm. And then Mm. the second one is very much about tapping into your inner voice, isn't it? Expressing that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I I always think of that quote from Picasso where he said, I spent my, I spent 20 years trying to paint like Raphael and then the rest of my life trying to paint like a child again. Just, and I think that's all it is. I just think that painting for me and also that I think is what my subject has always been is sort of nature and the outdoors that's what I tend to kind of choose so yeah. forest is my kind of most popular it's interesting because it does raise a question about the education system and like you as mm-hmm. with your with your background as a teacher it might be an interesting one for us to touch on a bit but um yeah. with art I'm not sure that the education system has necessarily thought through, or I didn't see it, at least if I speak for myself, I understood skills and I was looking at maybe a little bit of history of art, but Mm. no one ever said to me, use this as a way of expressing yourself. Mm -hmm. No one really said that to me. No, and, and and that's what, you know, we talk about a lot actually, and I have spoken about it a lot in the past with friends and sort of colleagues about how art within education, we are just getting it so wrong. And yeah. that our education system, in my in my opinion, massively suppresses creativity because we have this weird idea that when we're teaching art, for some reason, we need to copy or like yeah. aim towards someone. Whereas in maths, it's not like we're all trying to be like Stephen Hawking. Otherwise, we, none of us would get there. Like yeah. the reality is we, we don't seem to hone in on what people's skills are and passions are. We tend to kind of say, well, this is what Van Gogh painted like. So let's copy that and it will make lovely copies of sunflowers which look lovely but they don't encourage children to be expressive and every single toddler in every single nursery probably all around the world likes mark making yes and we'll pick up something and we'll make a mark on paper not thinking about what they're making but just thinking about oh this is me projecting myself onto the world that's you know it's a really important thing about you know affirming the sense of self but then somewhere in school it goes wrong And I noticed it with when I'm teaching in school, working with the little ones, they just, they create, they print, they mark, make everything. Yeah. You get to kind of seven, eight, nine year olds and suddenly it's, oh, I can't draw. Yeah. I'm not good at drawing. And where does this idea come in about being good at it? It's just, and most adults, most adults you speak to will say, oh, I can't do that. Yeah. Because it's this idea of product and what you're producing and whether it looks good. And actually one of my favorite stories, my art teacher doing my PGCE told us was that he was working with a little girl who was doing a painting of her picnic and she spent ages painting this and building it up and putting all the characters in and it was really lovely and she was really thinking about perspective and everything and then she went and got loads of black paint on her paintbrush and just blobbed all over the painting and he was watching and he was like oh what's happened and she said well it started raining so she was painting the process of her day rather than thinking about what it would look like at the end she was telling a story through her painting and I think that's what children do a lot more than adults. We believe that what we're doing is trying to produce something that people will like to look at. And actually, that's not what's important. What's yeah. important is how you get there and what it feels like when you're doing it. Oh, definitely. And that kind of the the way that you just described how you make something. I find myself as a painter, I find they're the better paintings because you can't possibly second guess what other people want or they're going to find mm-hmm. interesting. I remember one I did was an eye with like bits of gold paint and stuff like that. And this guy came up and he just said, oh, my God, it looks like my partner. It looks like her eye. And it, and obviously I had no idea. How could I have possibly known that this guy was going to yeah. come? And like, so you can't. You just need yeah. to draw what you see. Yeah. And he had this thing of he believed that you could transport p- through time or something through the eye. So it was like a, the wow. eye was a massive symbol to him. So he's really interesting. Guy. But, yeah, you can't second guess it. So you might as yeah. well just express yourself mm-hmm. <laughs> and then you know people will be attracted to that mm-hmm. and that's what I love about art is it's not supposed to appeal to everyone or no nope. uh, mass market you know no, there's gonna, exactly there's going to be some that appeal to that gen- mm-hmm. generally appeal to the human psyche when you probably go to such a deep level because that whole thing around the personal becomes universal I love what you're saying about just that freedom that kids have because I see that with my young children as well yeah exactly yeah. they just yeah. they don't think you know and it's so sad because actually my son said to me he say oh I don't want to do coloring because I can't stay in the line so obviously someone in his life it wasn't me but it's someone either at nursery or something and said oh try and stay inside the lines and now he doesn't want to do coloring he does do a lot of painting 
but he doesn't want colour now, which I just think is so sad that he already has this idea of conformity. And if you can't conform to what people want to see, then you just don't do it. Yeah. It's so sad to see it happen so quickly. And what do you think that people are missing out on? If you were to say to people, if they were going to pick up some art materials at the weekend for an adult, what would you say that they're missing out on if they don't do I think, I mean, there is research to show that the endorphins that you get from creating something, it doesn't necessarily have to be painting. Some people like knitting or crocheting or embroidery now is becoming really big, isn't it? Or pottery or whatever it is, but producing something that is entirely your own, not for the sake of someone else, just because you felt like making it and not even for someone else to see. But just that feeling of it's all to do with, and we've learned a lot about this in my course, in terms of when you develop your sense of self and you realise you're not attached to your mother and all this and kind of thing. The first thing you want to do is mark, mate, because it's a way of projecting yourself. It's a way of confirming I am here, I exist, and I, I, this is who I am and this is what I'm putting down. And I find, personally, if I know I haven't created for a while because I, I feel really stifled and I feel really pent up, Some people get that about running. Some people say, I need to go for a run. And it's the same feeling. And I think what a lot of people don't realise is their suppressed creativity will be causing them upset. Because I I don't believe that some people are creative and some people are not. Because there is lots of different ways to be creative. It might not be sitting and painting, but there are lots of different ways of playing and creating that will bring that pleasure and that kind of sense of, yeah, confirming who you are. That kind of affirmation of this is me and this is, I can see me in front of me now sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So that's an interesting phrase, the suppressed self. What, what do you think that people are suppressing and how do you think that can make you unwell? Well, I think, I think a lot of what comes with sort of, I mean, creating and playing are very similar in my opinion. And I think what comes with playing, which is obviously children do a lot, but adults don't do as much, is the fear of failure. Because if you play, there's a chance you might not either win or you might not get it right. And I think as adults, especially in our society, we have this belief that we have to present ourselves and we have to come across and be successful. So if you're playing, there's a chance you might not be successful and therefore that's damaging. Whereas if we allow ourselves to play and allow ourselves to be silly and to create and not worry about the idea of success and the product at the end, it will just let out all these fears of kind of holding tight this idea of I must not fail, I must not let myself, let my guard down, I must kind of remain, you know. So I think we just have to observe toddlers, really. Yeah. (laughs) Because toddlers just know how to do it. They do everything right, and it's so sad that we squash it out of them. But, you know, they create and they play and they cry and they shout and then they just move on. And and I think that's just, there's something in that. They're very much in the moment and, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's freeing, isn't it? I think mm. it, I, like that's what, yeah. what I, I take from what you said is there's that mm. freedom of expression and letting it out definitely. and like a purging. And yeah, I definitely relate to the running analogy as well that you mentioned mm. earlier. It's very back to basics, isn't it? Like we are animals, we need to run and mm-hmm. we need to eat, sleep, drink enough water and we need to express ourselves through mark making. It was, but it's what we do, I guess, before language. Exactly. We were storytellers through mark making for like long before we started talking. So yeah. we've lost somewhere along the way, we've lost this innate desire to do yeah, it. To do well, it. we haven't lost the desire. The desire's there. We're just not suppressing with that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So interesting. I would love us to move on now to creation number two. Yeah, so as you mentioned in my introduction, I was diagnosed with cancer a couple of years ago now. And my good friend, Rory, who I believe is one of your guests, had already done a similar project of doing something every day. So I kind of had to chat with my mum and I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be, because I knew I was going to be off work and because of, you know, the treatment and I couldn't be around children. So lots of them anyway. So I kind of decided, we talked about it, maybe I'll do, I'll get a sketchbook and I'll do a painting or drawing every day. And then, you know, I was talking a bit more about it and I was like, oh, and I could write something to go with it. And then I thought, maybe I could put it, put it out there. And I had a chat with Rory about it. And he said, look, it's in your control. If you start doing it, you hate it, you just stop it and take it down. I thought, okay. But actually it became this amazing way, not only for me to process, but actually for me to update friends and family so they didn't they often said to me I knew I didn't need to message you to be like how are you feeling today because I knew I would see it come up on my Instagram they all followed it and they could see it happening so it was a really nice way to kind of share my experience and I think some people might look at it and go wow that's kind of 
a lot, you know, putting yourself out there. And <laughs> the fact that I've now published it, I sometimes think to myself, oh my God, I've actually just published my diary. That is like, <laughs> oh, it's horrible. But I have to fight with that sometimes. And I did have to fight with it a lot, actually, during the whole process of feeling sort of narcissistic and, you know, me, 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 and woe is me. And it was hard at times, but the response I had from friends and family, but also from other people going through treatment yeah. or survivors or friends or family or supporters of people going through treatment kept me going. I had complete strangers messaging me to say, thank you so much for sharing this. You've inspired me to start my own diary, my own case journal, or you have shared your story and therefore helped me to understand what my friend is going through. So that's what made me continue. And then towards the end of the year, people started saying, well, are you going to put it in a book then? And I had thought about it myself. And I really feel that it helped me to not get closure because I don't feel that's the right thing for thinking about going through cancer treatment but more just process and kind of share the experience so I didn't it's not all in my head and it's not all trapped up there I've put pretty much everything I felt going through it in that you know journal so I don't feel like there's anything going on up there that isn't not there that makes sense yeah absolutely it really helped it really did I imagine it did it's such a brilliant body of work essentially I know that's not necessarily the way that you thought of it at the time but obviously Mm. me coming in at the end of it you've got your whole year which is incredible we hear a lot about the benefits of journaling Mm. and just for people who haven't seen it each day there's a sketch there's also the commentary that goes alongside Mm -hmm. it could you talk me through a typical day was there one particular time of day that you did it did you think about the image first and the words? How did that work? Well, I tended to end up doing it in the evening. So yeah. I'd put Milo down and then I'd go and sit and I'd usually do it on the sofa. Sometimes I would manage to sort of sit at the table and do it a bit earlier in the day. But often it was on the sofa at the end of the day, which made sense in terms of that was when I reflect on the day. During the day, I would notice things or I would have something that stuck out in my head that I'd think, yeah, I'm going to draw that later. Or I'm going to paint that later. And then the words would sort of start forming. (laughs) The funny thing is, when I stopped, obviously on the 31st of December, the next, about the next two, three weeks, every single day I realised I had this narrative in my head of, oh, today I, you know, or I would notice things and think I could do that. And it took quite a while to get out of that mindset of noticing things and thinking, oh, I could paint that, I could draw that, or I could mention that, or I could talk about that. So... Yeah, it really did become part of my whole mindset of kind of I'd notice something and it would make me think about something. Throughout the book, there's a lot of metaphors. And I remember one in particular, we were walking. I was out walking with Milo and all those spider webs over all the gauze bushes had dew all over them. So they were this, this it was incredible to see because they were just kind of wow. everywhere. We stopped and looked at them for a while and we're looking at the spiders. And then I drew a spider web and then talked about this idea of feeling suspended because it was kind of after my treatment had finished and I was sort of suspended midair, not really sure. So I kind of found myself finding all these, you know, little kind of metaphors around me. And I kind of wanted it to be something I could look back on I wanted to be able to look back and see there were good points for example I've got a picture of Harry in there and I've got a drawing of Milo in there and my best friend's wedding happened that year so I've got things about that in there and so there are like amazing highlights but then there were days when nothing really happened and I had to kind of really rack my brains of well I didn't really do much today and then I would start to feel guilty of oh am I just being a bit ridiculous and kind of making you know and actually it was Rory who said to me but Claire what is so important is it's those in between days that are so important and we can't live life thinking that it's always this big either really horrible things or amazing things there are just in between days and they're just meh days so he made me feel a lot better about it I was thinking a similar thing in that it does capture that ebb and flow because mm. when you're dealing with something as difficult to deal with as as that, then it's almost like looking back in history, you kind of imagine all of the dramatic moments. But actually, having lived through a pandemic, you realise there's a whole lot of nothingness in between. <laughs> so Yeah, definitely. And that nothingness is actually what makes life great in terms of if we didn't have that, if we were endlessly swinging between good and bad days or whatever, then you just would be 
yeah impossible but at the time I was so aware that people were looking at it and I was putting that on show to the world these mundane days where I wasn't surviving cancer or yeah you know suffering from chemo I kind of felt like oh why do people care what I'm doing today <laughs> but actually when it's all together in the book it I felt it was actually that was okay and that you know we need that as you say the ebb and flow we can't have this kind of <gasps> life isn't kind of a soap opera you know has these moments of still and quiet yeah. in between the kind of so yeah it kind yeah. of putting it all together really did help me to see that yeah there was one quote if I'm okay to just read a mm. snippet from it which I found a massive insight into the challenges it's a drawing a sketch of mm. one of these toxic waste containers and it says, I am drained. I am a drain. I feel like I do nothing but suck the life from those around me, just like the cancer is trying to suck the life from me. I do remember that. I do remember that really yeah. clearly. So, I mean, that's that's a really hard hitting post. Yeah. And there are a few like that where mm. it's not the in-between. It's not the positive ones. You were mm. so honest in it. Mm. And that must have been really challenging. But you know, I really admire your courage in being able to express it. What made you want to go to that level of honesty? And what was the feedback you got from friends, family or, or people who were going through cancer? There were lots of moments like that. And there were some times when I didn't actually. And I can find the pictures where I've just written something random and knowing that actually that day I was feeling a lot of other things, but just not wanting to always share exactly yeah. what was going on. But that day, yeah, I just remember it being hard. And I, <laughs> funny enough, the beginning of the post said, look, I'm not doing this in order to gain sympathy because again, I felt this kind of, I don't want to moan and feel like people then feel the need to then message me saying, oh, I'm so sorry you feel that way. Cause I just didn't, that's not why I was saying it. Yeah, I was saying it because I wanted to shed light on how it felt. And funny enough, I think around that time, I'd actually listened to a podcast, which I think was part of You, Me and the Big C, about the guilt. And a lot of people say when they go through treatment, they'd almost rather have no one to love them. Because it's even though it's a huge thing and it supports you, the guilt and the kind of knowing that you're causing someone else pain, not on purpose, but what's happening to you is hurting someone else is so hard to kind of cope with. And it's just also you kind of not often but there were times when I felt like my presence in the room and my presence within people's minds you know whatever was this drain this kind of like dark energy and it's hard to put that into words but funnily enough when I posted that picture that day and the caption to go with it I think I had three or four messages from not only Lot, I had lots of messages on my phone from friends and family, yeah. you know, telling them they love me and everything, saying, I know you don't want to hear this. I know this is why you didn't do it. <laughs> but, saying it anyway. but then I also had people on Instagram saying that image of the toxic waste completely summed up how they felt. Just that kind of feeling of just feeling like this absolute, you know, and also because obviously you've got a lot of chemicals and drugs in you, you feel yeah. this sense of I'm not natural. I'm not kind of right now, you know, I've got all these horrible things in me. So yeah. yeah, a lot of people reached out to say that that had resonated with them, that feeling of just feeling like a drain and feeling like this kind of black cloud, basically, that kind of hovers. And so having that feedback then made me feel that I wasn't alone. And that yeah. encouraged me to carry on with sharing those feelings. And I didn't want to do it too often because obviously I didn't want people to be signing off every day and seeing these horrible posts. But, and the reality was I didn't feel like that every day. And there were days I felt that way and I felt really low. And there were days when I felt better and grateful and I was okay. So yeah, yeah I think that post in particular was one that actually spurred me on because of the response I got from it in terms of other people. So. <laughs> Oh, I bet. Yeah, it's nice to kind of feel seen and heard, especially when you're going through something like that. And yeah. did you find it sometimes easier when you were talking to people that didn't know you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I have one friend who I will call her a friend and she probably would do the same, who <laughs> lives in New Zealand. We've never met face to face. We connected early on because I found her on Instagram. She was also sharing her experience, though she went through treatment back in 2020 her baby was 10 weeks old at the time. So she had it really tough in the beginning of motherhood going through treatment. But we, you know, speak a lot and we kind of message back and forth. She's also had this amazing, and we were actually talking, about, I was talking to her about the fact that I'm now 
doing something completely different and things that come out of you know my experience with cancer and she said it's called post-traumatic growth where this something comes out of this traumatic experience and it changes your mindset and changes your perspective and allows you to move in a way you wouldn't have done so before so she now actually works for a breast cancer charity in New Zealand and she was doing something completely different before so yeah it's connecting with people and chatting with her knowing that she knew exactly how I was feeling was yeah. really good and also knowing I wasn't burdening her by yeah. talking to her about the things I was struggling with because I knew that she wasn't going to carry it in the same way my friends and family would yeah. not something you want to hear that someone you love is suffering whereas if it's someone who's far away but has experienced it too it's a different sort of relationship yeah. so and I had lots of people like that that I connected with through Instagram so yeah no, it's brilliant. And I, yeah. I also, one of my other examples, this is one of my favourite ones, it says high brows. So can you talk us through of that? It's such a practical example. Yeah, no, I mean, the funny thing is when they first said chemo, I think the first thing my brain conjured up was an image of me with no hair, which I kind of was okay with. And I was okay with losing my hair, but I shaved it off quite quickly. And actually... I was quite lucky and a lot of people said to me not not sound like I'm bragging but a lot of people said oh actually you suit that <laughs> the eyebrows was really hard I really struggled with that bit because losing hair you can kind of wear a hat or actually it doesn't really change your face your hair even though it does at the end of the day because we all wear our hair up sometimes you know your face shape stays the same yeah. but losing your eyebrows completely changes your face yeah and obviously my eyelashes kind of went too and Every time I looked in the mirror, I just felt really, really upset because I just looked ill. I looked sick and I didn't like it. And they started to go and I started just using like pencil and powders, but nothing was really working. And then I was on my Instagram and this advert came up for stick on eyebrows. So I ordered some and stuck them on and I was like, oh my God, I look like me again. (laughs) And it was just this feeling of kind of being able to just see my reflection in the mirror and not be like, shocked by kind of what was looking back so it was absolutely yeah game changing in terms of my confidence of going out you know because I had lots of head scarves and hats and that's you know I can cope with that but just that's so much part of your face it really yeah. shape they really shape your face so yeah finding those stick-ons were amazing so when I shared them a lot of people were like oh my god I'm gonna get them. <laughs> because I think a lot of people were in the same situation of just feeling yeah. really fed up yeah the only problem was is they Start, obviously started to peel off so <laughs> Harry would say to me occasionally I think you need to read <laughs> and then I'm glad you mentioned Harry how did your drawings and, and paintings or ske- sketches how did they help you to communicate with your husband because you're living in the same house did he read them did he look at them yeah he did and sometimes he would sort of turn to me after reading the post and be like why didn't you tell me or you know <laughs> kind of you know, you can talk to me about this. And I'm like, I know I can, but sometimes it's easier to put it in here first because it was such a kind of way through. Sometimes I'd ask him, I'd say, what do you think about me saying this? Or, you know, just for his opinion, not not his permission, but his opinion kind of in terms of, do you think it's too much? And he was so supportive of it, obviously. And he's so much a part of the journey. He's Him and Milo are both mentioned a lot, and my mum, obviously. But... Yeah, he was always great at sort of giving me the time and space to do it as well. (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes sometimes joined me, but not very often. (laughs) (laughs) And how long would it take you to do one of them? I mean, some of them, not long at all. Like, there are some which I didn't spend long on them at all. But there are some, I think there's an elephant sketch, which took me a very long time. There's a sketch of my own face, which took me quite a while. You know, it depends. Some days I just was not in the mood for it at all. And I really resented actually having to sit down and do it. But there was something in that, that resentment of doing it, that made it even more powerful. Yeah. Because it was this gave me the sense of purpose of kind of, I need to do that sort of thing. And it's funny, I go through phases of not looking at it that often. And then I kind of come across it again and just glance at it or I see it in people's houses. And it's quite like, you know, but um, it does. Yeah, it does hold so much in terms of the year, really. Yeah. Kind of the whole experience. Do you miss it? I did initially. Yeah, I did. Actually, it was really weird the first couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. But the time I was still doing the book. So that was still sort of happening. That was ticking over. So I was updating the Instagram account with when the book was coming. Yeah. Yeah, I did miss it. But equally, it freed up so much time. (laughs) (laughs) And I wasn't having to think whenever I went away, don't forget all the stuff to do that. 
it freed up time to do other creative projects. And yeah, exactly. I started my course by that point. I do sometimes miss the fact that I was forced to do something creative every day because now I don't necessarily have the time to do something creative every day. So I miss yeah. that in the sense that I was forced, not forced to, but, you know, it's locked in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You'd committed to it and you were going to see it through. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Exactly. And you said something in there that says you talk about living with heart. What do you mean by living with heart? I think... I think it has changed, and I don't mean to sound sort of cringy, but it has changed the whole project and year of going through treatment, really changed my perspective on things and living, I guess, in a way that is a lot more well, being grateful and a lot more loving and really grabbing life rather than kind of just letting life happen, which actually leads me on quite nicely to my tattoo that I designed uh, yeah. because I... I had always wanted to get a tattoo and never really had the guts to do it or never really had an idea of what I really, really wanted. So so this is this is your creation three, isn't it? Yes. Brilliant segue. It's, it is. <laughs> my, it's my third creation I wanted to share. Well, I have two, actually. I got two at the same time. Everyone found it funny that I've got two, but they're very small. But I got, if it's possible to show, I essentially got on my wrist 926 because Milo was born at 926 on the 26th of the 9th. So it oh. works because it's digital numbers. It works both ways. So I got that one for Milo. But then at the same time, I got this one on my arm, yep. which is a line and then a dot. Because on the day that I found out that my results from the lab were negative, they didn't find any sign of the cancer within the breast tissue that was removed. My image that I did in the book was just a line. And every day I always did a dot after the captions. So I'd write the caption and do a dot. So for me, the line, the dot is signifying ne negative and then that's it. Kind of like end of that. It's also Morse code for N, so no more yeah. <laughs> negative. And also what I quite liked about it is when I do this, it becomes an exclamation mark, which is the whole idea of kind of grabbing life and living life to the full and, you know, living kind of in a way that is, as I said, not waiting for life to happen, but doing what I want and really being passionate about what I want. And Oh, I love so that. Kind of, yeah, it signifies a lot for me, though it's very small <laughs> and simple. <brilliant. laughs> has a lot of meaning to it, yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Did you go alone? I didn't tell anyone. Yeah, I didn't uh, tell anyone I was going. And then I surprised everyone with a picture. So brilliant. You... My mum was particularly happy. <laughs> but they're <laughs> small, so I think she's all right. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel now when you look at it? What does it give you? I have a few sort of scars on my body from treatment. I have one... Funnily enough, not far from where the tattoo is. It's from the pick line I had put in, which yeah. I did not like at all. So it's something I can look at, which is a scar that I've chosen. It's something that I've chosen, a mark that I have made. And I guess it's all linked in with the mark making and this idea of projecting is that I have mark made on my own body to signify something that I went through. Yeah. And though it sounds strange, it was very important. And I'm actually really grateful for that whole experience because it's taught me so much in terms of who I am and who I want to be rather than what I was before I was suppressing a lot of that so yeah it's always a little reminder when I look at it and it's also oh, actually I didn't say that because of my mastectomy I joke that it's the line and the dot <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> because uh, yeah the fact that I had a single mastectomy so yeah I think it's em empowering in that sense and it's giving me that sense of I've chosen it rather than it was inflicted upon me brilliant I think that's that's so interesting to know and it takes it all the way through doesn't it to kind of where you are now there's a big change that you've you've been through an extraordinary experience and yet you wouldn't say that you wouldn't have wanted it because it's obviously changed where you are now so what are you doing now so I am currently training at Roehampton University to be a art psychotherapist which is something I've looked into and thought about a lot because I also did psychology at university and I've always loved art. And actually, when you combine those, you kind of come out with this art psychotherapist. So I looked into it, but obviously it's expensive. And obviously it takes a lot of time. And we had Milo back in 2019 and we're planning to have another. Funny enough, we had just talked about starting trying and then my diagnosis came in. So that had to stop. A month before I was diagnosed, I actually had taken out life insurance mm. because I lost my aunt to cancer. And what came with that was critical illness cover, which you know, my cancer counted. So I made a claim. It took a long time because they really had to kind of dive into how on earth I'd managed to take out life insurance a month before I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Yeah. But they did believe me that it was just 
horrible bad luck. And so I ended up getting quite a good payout through that insurance. Funny enough, I was phoned by the assessor to tell me that they were going to pay out while I was in hospital. And obviously I just broke down <laughs> this poor woman. But yeah. only a few days before I'd been offered a place on this oh. art psychotherapy course. So the whole thing was very kind of oh. coincidental, as Carl Jung would say, but in my head, it all meant a lot. So that enabled me to do the course because I could pay for it because there's no way I'll be able to pay for it otherwise. But also not only that, but because I have to have this break where we can't have another child for a couple of years because of the treatment I have to be on for the next few years that's trying to prevent a recurrence. It kind of all lined up that I have these three years where I can train part time, still work a bit to bring in a bit of income. But essentially, it's allowing me to do my dream career. So which is why when people say, oh, God, you know, I'm like, well, actually, if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't be doing this. So yeah. it's a very strange setup, I guess, in that sense. Oh, that's fantastic. I got goosebumps when you're describing that story, because the fact that you you got the place and the money at the same time, it's a lo- lovely part of your story. I'm really pleased that you've managed to start the course. What do you intend to do with the qualification once you've finished? Not to go into politics, but the government we have doesn't necessarily put a lot of money into mental health, but people are realising how important it is and they're trying to put it, you know, in themselves. So when I'm qualified, the hope is that I can work. You have to work for three years before you're allowed to do your own private practice. So I'll be working hopefully either in a school or a hospital or a hospice or charity. The kind of long-term slightly more fantasy in terms of a goal it's not really a goal it's a fantasy is this idea that I would absolutely love to set up a place where people can come and be creative essentially a bit like a gym or a leisure center but for creativity so you'd have a room where you could do pottery because there's another bit I actually love doing or there's a painting room or there is a music room or there is a creative writing room or you know there's loads of different areas but then also you'd have therapy rooms where you can have music therapy or art therapy drama therapy so just really somewhere where people can go and unleash that creativity that they have suppressed and actually find themselves in that sense but obviously that's a goal that is (laughs) yeah very much I love that I love I love that idea of the art leisure center or the the kind of creative leisure center because why not like why do we think that it's so important to sleep and to eat well and to exercise and yet back to our conversation right at the start of our chat it's it's so important and fundamental to people and yet we're not acknowledging it and especially as you say with that mental health crisis god I think I would like to live in a world where there's art leisure centers on you know in every kind of town planner's handbook for the best town yeah well exactly and I think you know people spend a lot of money on gym memberships and I obviously I'm not in any way implying that we should give up those because I think being fit and healthy is also really important but I just think that creativity should be alongside that and I just think that if we make it a habit and make it part of our lives then I think the impact that we will have because the reality is you know with with everything the way it's going with technology and AI and all this the one thing that stands us far is our creativity and our ability to play yeah you know I know that they can program them to create something and you can create things using AI but at the end of the day really the, what we have as humans is unique and Absolutely. rather than conditioning that out of us as children we should be encouraging it yeah absolutely and you have to listen don't you you have to listen to yourself in order to create something and I think we're all watching television or looking at phones and I don't know doing something to dampen that voice down or quiet it down and I think that's that suppression isn't it whereas if you're faced with a blank canvas or page or or clay that gives such an opportunity for you to actually just go I'm doing something with my hands I've got something to show for it let's just tap into to what's inside absolutely and actually we've had the privilege of being able to listen to some service users accounts of their experience with art therapy and it's incredible to hear you know people who said exactly what we said at the beginning about oh I can't draw I'm not good at art and then have got into these you know started just doing one-to-one art therapy ended up signing up to different art therapy groups and then even when the therapy was finished carrying on with art just going to art classes because they found this my god this outlet that is so powerful and I think just it's it's a funny one because it's almost you know knowing 
the impact that art can have and creating can have you just want to tell everyone you just want to say just why don't you just have a go with some paints or why don't you just <laughs> get a piece of clay and start playing with it and funny enough because we would obviously on uni days we do some art making we'd talk about something we'd learn about something then we'd go and do response art and then we'd bring it back and we'd all sit in a big circle and put it in the middle and at the beginning I hated it because I hated this idea of oh, what am I making so I need to make it look good but then by the last day of this year I just put something down I didn't particularly like it but what I enjoyed was making it and thinking about things while I was making it. And I didn't feel this shame putting it down in front of people. That took me a year and I'm an artist. Yeah. And, you know, I create a lot. So it is something that takes a lot of undoing this conditioning of believing that what you put down in front of people, people need to like. But at exactly. the end of the day, as you said, you know, with the eye, some people might really like it and some might like just glance past it. You know, yeah. that's not what's important it's the projection of yourself that you are freeing as you say from the kind of shadow and the you know from the darkness yeah (laughs) absolutely and I I don't know how I would go through life now that I've found or rediscovered painting as an outlet because having some kind of vessel having some kind of way to articulate that is so important to me and that's what I saw in your expression throughout your A Year With C but also it's something that clearly you still do yourself to the benefit of your own well-being and that's why we're here with this podcast really is because I feel so passionately like you do to just say honestly guys just give it a go <laughs> you'll feel better. Yeah. No exactly and that and that is something that I think it's just trying to share this it's kind of like you've got this secret that you feel the need to share because, you know, you suddenly just want everyone to feel yeah. what you feel. But it is hard sometimes trying to, you know, I I was set up to do my first art class when I was diagnosed, so that had to be cancelled. But, you know, I have kind of had all these ideas and I would really like to set up doing workshops, but equally I want to make sure I go back to the right way because what I don't want is people to come and think that they are going to learn to do what I do. I don't want to show them my paintings or yeah. my pictures and go, this is what you need to produce. I want them to come and unleash and just unlock and just be free. Yeah. And therefore, how I go about that, I want to make sure I go about it in exactly the right way. Yeah, I think that's so important because it's weird because when I do exhibitions, people come and talk to me and they say, oh, do you do classes? And I've never felt I always kind of go I don't know how I would do a class like that was my initial thing I was like I don't know why people would want to learn to paint like me because I'm kind of like that's not the point and I it really that's the main thing is you know I'm happy for them to see me paint it's not the issue I've had people in my studio paint alongside me but I'm like find your own reference or your own thought and just do it yourself you know do what you want to do because exactly as you say the point to me of painting isn't to to copy what I'm doing is is to express something inside exactly and I think by just it's a bit of an oxymoron in itself teaching art yeah (laughs) because it it shouldn't need to be taught yeah it should something that comes from within the only thing that I I've kind of landed upon is this idea of just of just facilitating yes and that's what you know that's what I kind of would paint myself out to be is fun but is someone that facilitates and create just allows a space and yeah. therefore and just provides materials and provides a space and just goes okay well today we're gonna finger paint yes or today we're gonna print make with all these cars and pricks and stuff you know and that sort of thing will hopefully would just unlock and kind of allow people to kind of slowly come out of this yeah what this what they have their frame of reference for art yeah, because what you're doing there actually is in the similar way to your a year with C documenting is you were very clear it's one a day and they all seem to be a certain size and you did it at a certain time of day. There, there's some real constraints there and it's come up a couple of times in conversations, which is if you're creating the environment, even if you said to someone you can create anything, they'd probably be a bit like, ooh, feel a bit wobbly. Whereas actually you're going, right, today it's finger painting. It's like, okay, fine, right. Now it's just using my fingers. And and then they can focus and just express within those um, limits. Um, yeah, so. exactly. And I think that's something that we've talked about a lot in our course, this idea that as humans, we are constantly teetering on this need for certainty and need for understanding, but equally that freedom the freedom of uncertainty so we're constantly kind of under some people are much more in the uncertain and some people are happy to live there some people need the certain yes but in reality what we need is a little bit of it a little kind of that constancy so as you say kind of providing some structure allows people to feel safe 
but it's like boundaries we talk a lot about that in therapy about this idea of boundaries same with children we don't want to completely confine them but equally if we don't provide some boundaries for them they don't feel safe and yeah. that's when you see children who are just climbing the walls because they don't feel that they know where their boundaries are and their safety is and that we as adults want boundaries we want safety we want to know that certain things are going to run how we expect them to we don't want every day to be unexpected we don't want to just turn up to work one day and everyone's suddenly sitting on the ceiling because that would freak us out so we, yeah. we have to have some things that go as expected but equally having some things that are unexpected and uncertain is also really important to keep us kind of centered if we're yeah. too certain if we're too sure of ourselves then we're stuck we can't move we're literally standing in this box so it's kind of trying to find that balance between freedom and certainty that we are endlessly <laughs> wobbling between, I think. I find it fascinating. I've never thought of it or heard it explained in that way. One of the ways I think of it as well is that need to feel alive. So you've kind of got the day-to-day things, but I do think that you kind of need that injection of something awe-inspiring, something stimulating. And I think as humans, it's why we go traveling or it's why we want to experience different music or different art, just, just different experiences in general. I think as humans, we want those differences and they help me and help people feel alive. Yeah, um, absolutely. And yeah. and. I think it works on the other way as well is actually, and I was trying to explain this to my husband last night, but, you know, we can't have joy without suffering. Yes. And, you know, we can't have one without the other. And so we also, on top of seeking these incredible experiences, actually, we do seek out pain and we do yeah. seek out to witness pain because we watch films which have devastating things happen and we we as humans want to see that because we want to as you say feel alive and the only way to feel alive is to feel that that life is precious and fragile so there's this balance again of finding these incredible experiences but also having this understanding that you know terrible things can happen as well so absolutely I mean I found myself I don't know if you've read Susan Cain's book Bittersweet no I haven't I'll have to have a look yeah I've I've read it twice now. I really enjoy it. It basically talks about that whole thing of she's always been a lady who likes sad songs and she loves Leonard Cohen. And some of her friends would kind of take the mitt to just go like, why are you listening to these sad songs? And she's like, no, but it makes me feel like it connects with me. It, it calls me inside. And it's exactly that type of thing that you described, that teaching on the edge, that if I feel sadness and sorrow, it opens my heart. And it makes me appreciate what's happening in the moment. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. That really resonates with me, actually, because I, I, a lot of people have said similar things to me. Actually, Harry, you know, he says, oh, why do you like listening to Adele, for example? I've always <laughs> loved listening to Adele because she, she really connects with me and I really feel like she gets it. Yeah. And then funnily enough, Adele's new album came out around the time I was diagnosed. And Harry used to listen to it. And I don't think he'll mind me saying this, but he used to listen to it on the way to work and just sob and sob and sob and sob. And even now, you know, when some of the songs come on, it really gets him. And he finally understands that you don't have to listen to happy music all the time. And actually listening to sad music, listening to music that evokes those emotions in you is also really important because you're acknowledging them. And you're yes. allowing them, as you say, allowing them space and you're allowing that, oh my God, this is so devastatingly sad. And then you can come back to, okay, but this is also good. You know, it's that balance. Yeah. It's that kind of seesaw of emotions that you desperately need in our life. And that, and there's this quote that I love, which is happiness is not the absence of problem. Yeah. And that is true. We can't have this idea that we can just be happy and your life is carefree. It's just no. impossible. Yeah, well, like last year was one of the best years of my life, despite what happens. So, you know, yeah, it's incredible that you're able to say that. And I would imagine that that artistic expression is a big reason for you to have processed it. Imagine if you'd had all of that still pent up, you you might have still been dealing with it now. Oh, 100 percent. I 100 percent would say that the reason that I think that I've managed to process. I mean, obviously, I was incredibly lucky that I had a good prognosis from the beginning. And that had good results. I'm not denying that science and medication did not save my life, but the creativity and being able to process it in the way that I did helped me so much mentally. Um, And that I really wouldn't be where I am now without it. I mean, on top of that, obviously, I have had therapy 
because we have to have therapy for the course anyway. But actually, I didn't really spend that much time talking about cancer. And I remember her saying towards the end of my therapy sessions, you know, do you want to talk about it? And I'm like, well, the thing is with my cancer, she went, my cancer? Do you feel it? And I was like, yeah, my cancer, in the sense that it was something that it was my experience. And I feel like, you know, it's really changed me. I'm not in any way trying to put a silver lining on it because it's obviously crap, <laughs> it's cancer. <laughs> but I was incredibly lucky. And what has come from it, I just would never have got, never. I would never even come close. So yeah, it's a funny one. <laughs> yeah, it really is. There's like those two sides, isn't it? Absolutely. Right, well, we're at the end of our journey. Thank you so much for coming today and sharing all of your experiences. It's been absolutely fascinating. I've absolutely enjoyed every minute of it. So as a closing tradition, I'd like to congratulate you. You have made it through the forest and you are now an official Art After Dark Illuminati. <laughs> there are two duties that go with this. The first one is to help people to find a way that they could experience even just a little bit of the benefits that you have from the art. So is there something they could do to find a way in? And the second one is if you could recommend someone who would come into the forest and share their stories with me. So in terms of accessing, I think a good place to start is either watercolour paint or actually you can just get a lot of the drawings I did in my book were paintings rather were just powder paint that I actually got from Tiger so they're not expensive you don't have to spend a lot of money they mix with water really well and just to start just thinking about patterns and colour and there's an amazing children's book called The Dot which is absolutely brilliant about a young girl who doesn't want to do art because she can't draw so the teacher says well just make a mark so she ends up just getting the pen and just diving it into the paper and just producing a dot and then just properly goes up to the teacher and shows her and she says hands it back to her and says okay now sign it so she's like so she signs it so then the next day she comes in and she's like I'll do a bigger dot then and this is what art can do for you if you just start with something very small and simple it doesn't have to be something that you want to frame it can be something very very easy and fun and water and paint just creates images in a way that is quite nice so that's what I'd recommend in terms of getting going in terms of a guest my good friend Kip on my course is a fellow artist and training to be an art psychotherapist as well and I think he would have a lot to share about his experiences and how art has really really helped him that's oh, the one I think that... I would put forward oh that's fantastic yeah that would be great yeah. uh, I love the idea of that that book so anybody who's listening <laughs> All of the things that we've mentioned today will be in the show notes. And Claire, where can people find your A Year With C? So I'm on Instagram, A Year With C, and the book is on Amazon. So if you just go onto Amazon and type in A Year With C, there is Kindle, paperback and hardback. Available. Fantastic. Thank you so much again. And I really wish you all the best with the rest of your course and have a lovely rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really hope that you've enjoyed our conversation in the forest today. Remember to tag me on socials at artafterdark.co if you've been inspired to create or to share any thoughts on this episode. I'd absolutely love to hear from you and to see what you've been up to. You can find all images and details of the creations we discussed in the show notes on my website, louiseemily.com. <laughs>